Brother Tim. Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. And I'm sure that you are indeed very thankful, uh, as I am, as all of us uh, would be. Uh, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Tim. Well, if you'll open your Bible to Matthew chapter number 5 once again. Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to continue on with our study uh, here in Matthew's Gospel on the Sermon on the Mount. It covers chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. We're at the very beginning uh, portion here looking at these Beatitudes. There are nine of them uh, from verse 3 down through verse number 11. Uh, we've come to the fifth one now in verse number 7. And uh, so we'll be looking at this together uh, this morning. And so let's go ahead and stand together, if you would, to honor the public reading of the Word of God. We'll read uh, the Scripture, we'll pray uh, together, and then we'll see what the Lord has for our teaching and our understanding and our, our, our discipling and our equipping today. Beginning with verse number 1, the Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you so much for the reading of the Word of God once again this morning. Lord, the opportunity to study your Word together. And we pray that uh, by the preaching of your Word and the presence of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we would indeed be able to learn and that you would equip us, that you would help us, that you would teach us, that you would instruct us that we could live our lives in a way that would be pleasing to you. And therefore, you could bless us. And Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings uh, today. We pray that you would indeed speak to our hearts even in this moment. And Lord, as always, we would pray for souls to be saved and lives to be changed. And Lord, we pray you'd send us a revival. We thank you for all you do. In Jesus' precious name, we humbly pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Thank you for standing for the Word of God once again. Well, the fifth beatitude in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let me remind you what we're looking at when we look at these single verses of Scripture one by one that we call the beatitudes. They are attitudes that ought to be in our lives as Christians. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is describing really uh, what it means to be a real Christian. You notice that these are lessons that he taught to his disciples according to verse number 1. He went up in the mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him. In verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught them. Uh, and so these are lessons for disciples. But they are lessons that have been recorded and preserved in our Bible for our teaching as well. Can you say amen to that? In fact, the truth of the matter is, if, if, if you uh, claim Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, you would uh, call yourself a Christian. According to the Bible, you are a disciple of the Lord as well. Uh, you are a disciple. The word disciple uh, really means a follower. And if you've been saved, then according to the Bible, you must be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're his disciple as well. So these are lessons not just for those in, in this day as recorded here in Matthew chapter 5, but it's lessons for us also. And as Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with these Beatitudes, understand this about them, that, that these are not sayings that can be taken on their own. Uh, many people do this, and it's really it's a wrong way to study the Bible. It's a wrong way to interpret. Many people mistakenly will take one of these Beatitudes and take it out of its context and, and build a case for some absolutely unbiblical uh, un doctrine. And they'll use this and say in, in that one verse, it's not the way to study the Bible. The Bible needs to be studied as a whole and within its context. For the Beatitudes to be understood correctly and to be applied properly, 
they must also be understood as a whole, all nine of them together. Jesus does not teach haphazardly. He never did. Uh, he teaches with a purpose and in a logical and spiritual sequence. Each beatitude fitly follows the preceding one. And, and, and so the character of the beatitudes uh, is this. They, they can impose on us, and, and I believe the purpose of the Lord Jesus in teaching this way, it imposes upon us some, some very critical and some very searching questions. For instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says, Examine yourselves whether ye you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. The Beatitudes taken as a whole and the sequence and the purpose that you see that Jesus has in teaching them uh, the way that he does. These Beatitudes help us to do that. They help us to examine ourselves, uh, whether we're in the faith or not. They help us to ask the question, are these things really evident in my life? Do they describe uh, who I am and how I live? That's the questions that should be asked. Understand this about the Christian life. The primary emphasis for the gospel is this. Now watch this. The primary emphasis in the gospel is on being and not on doing. Can you say amen? Have you learned that? That's the emphasis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not your doing certain things that makes you a Christian. It is being a Christian that, that makes you to do certain things. The being is what is important. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, you remember the verses, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's not anything that you've done. And he goes on, the next verse makes that plain. Not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing that you can brag about, your church attendance, your religious activities, your this or that or the other. Because, dear friend, there's nothing that you and I can do on our own that, uh, that provides us with salvation, that saves us. And then he goes on and says, For we are His workmanship. We are His special creation. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And so you see, it's being a Christian that, that, can, that will cause us and lead us to do the things that gives evidence that we are a Christian. Amen. And that's what the Beatitudes really is, is all about. Because you see, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is concerned about our disposition. And that's why we talk about the Beatitudes, the attitudes that ought to be visible, evident in our lives as, as Christians. He's concerned about our disposition. Uh, because think of it like this. To really be a Christian means that you will possess certain character traits. And, and therefore, you will be a certain type of person. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are are become new. And so to be a Christian, uh, you're a new creation, a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. The old things, the old life's been put away. Everything has become new, and so it means you've become a new person. Amen. When a person gets saved, they become a new person, a new individual in the Lord. And, and, and uh, that's what the Beatitudes, again, is about. For instance, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be ye therefore... Therefore, therefore, what? Because you're a new creature. You're a new cre uh, creation. Uh, you're a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be ye therefore followers or disciples, but followers of God as dear children. And, and that word followers in Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 1, I've I, 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 I mentioned it to you before. Uh, we've learned this. The word followers there uh, can actually mean uh, an imitator, an imitator of God. Uh, in other words, you want to be like God. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a family emphasis uh, here. 
And so to be saved means you're a new creation, a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away, behold, all things are become new. And when you're saved uh, by the grace of God, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and uh, verse number 8, uh, verse number 9, not by any works that you've done, when you've been saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are God's workmanship and you've been created under good works. There are works that you do. There are works that we do that give evidence uh, that we're new creatures in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are followers of God. And the Bible says, be follower of God as dear children. So in other words, like father, uh, like child. Amen. Like father, like son. Be followers of God as dear children. And so that brings us all to this understanding. Now don't miss this. Our doing, as Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Our doing is the outcome of our being. Too often people get it turned around backwards. They think that, that, they think that it's your, uh, it, it's your uh, doing that, that makes your being of a Christian. No, our doing is the outcome of our being. And, and so to apply the Beatitudes is to examine ourselves and really look at ourselves and, and answer that question, am I really a Christian? Have I really been saved according to the way the Bible describes am I a Christian or not? You know, in John chapter number three, you remember how the, the Bible describes a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. And when it says he's a man of the Pharisees, uh, he was one of the religious leaders, uh, even a religious teacher uh, in the, in, uh, among the Jews in that day. The Pharisees were looked at as being uh, men of great righteousness and, and faith in God. and They, they, they were the leaders uh, in the Jewish religion uh, in that day. And, and, and so he comes to Jesus, the Bible says, by night. And, and, he, and he says to him, he says, uh, we know that thou art uh, a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And so he, he's wanting to find out, Jesus, just just who are you? We, uh, we, we don't, it's like he doesn't understand it. And Jesus said to him, you remember John chapter 3, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, he's really saying to Nicodemus, a, 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 really a great religious man, he said, if you're not born again, you're not going to understand it. If you're not born again, you're not going to be able to see it. If you're not born again, you're, 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 not, going to, you're not going to have it. And remember, he's talking to a man of the Pharisees, and while you're looking in Matthew chapter 5, if you look over to verse number 20 once again, where Jesus tells his disciples, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye, uh, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now this is following his teaching with the Beatitudes that, that we're studying now. And, and so you see from verse number 20 that, that the application and the purpose of his teaching is for us to realize that, that, uh, that it is our being that is, is, is most important. Our being is what uh, would lead us to our proper doing. Our doing is the outcome of our being. Uh, people like Nicodemus, they had it backwards. And so that's what Jesus is teaching here. He's teaching the very truth that these Beatitudes we need to see. Are, are they describing our lives? Is this the way we're living our lives? Because it is his teaching on the living of the Christian uh, life. It's not the outward doing, but it is the inner being that is the most important. And so you see, uh, dear friend, there, there are many people today that are doing all kinds of good things, but inside they've never been born again. 
And, and when Jesus said you must be born again, he means just exactly that. That means that there's a starting over point in your life. You have, you have your first birth, which is physical, as your birth into the world. But then there, to go to heaven, there must be a, a second birth, which is spiritual. And Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus that that which is of the flesh is of the flesh, but that which is of the spirit is, is, is spiritual. We, we've got to have that spiritual birth to see the kingdom of God and to enter into uh, the kingdom of heaven. These beatitudes really are describing the, the life of the individual, the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the life of the individual that has indeed entered into that kingdom of heaven, that has been born again, that has experienced that second birth and not just the first physical birth only. And so in each one, he says, these are those that are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Each one of these, Jesus says, now this is the description of those that, that are the blessed. And so what, what is the word blessed? Let's get our definition together again. We've said it often perhaps in every, in every time we've studied this. And, and, we, and we should remember it. Uh, the word blessed here means divine joy and perfect happiness. It means an inner satisfaction and sufficiency which does not depend upon outward circumstances. So in other words, when he says blessed are each one of these as it's described, blessed are those that, are, that their lives are described this way. These are those that have had something take place on the inside, amen, thus being born again by the Spirit of God. And, and so let's look at this one uh, once again. Uh, verse number seven, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain uh, mercy. It's beatitude number five. And we'll look at it in the same way, the same form that we've looked at each one. So far, we start with the, re with the recipients. And so who is the recipients of the blessedness here? Blessed are the merciful. Those who are merciful, Jesus says, are the ones that have this divine joy, perfect happiness, inner satisfaction and sufficiency, which does not depend upon outward circumstances. It is for those who are merciful. And so how do we apply that? How do we understand it? Well, first of all, we've got to know what does he mean by merciful? Amen. What do you mean? What do you mean merciful? What does it mean to be merciful? Let me give you three thoughts here. First of all, it does not, let me give you the negative now, it does not mean to be easy going. It does not mean to be easy going. Some think that to be merciful means that you just look over things. That you just let things, you know, uh, happen the way, you, you let things go on no matter how sinful or how unbiblical it might be. They think, well, we're, we're merciful. A phrase that's being used in, in a lot of churches today, and, and, it, and it sounds good, but I, I, I'm convinced that, that, you know, we've got to be careful about it. But a phrase that's being used today, you may have heard it when people say that we want to extend grace. Extend, we're, at our church, we extend grace to people. And, and by and large, they use that statement to say that, and I would agree with it, we want you to come as you are. And we do here at Grace Baptist Church as well, amen? amen. We want you to come as you are, but we don't want you to, we don't want you to go as you were, amen? <laughs> We want you to come as you are and find the Lord Jesus Christ the Savior. Let Him change your life. Uh, that's what we want to say. But oftentimes I'm thinking that, uh, that it's more of a uh, placating people's sins. We, 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 we want to be just, we just give mercy, we're merciful to you. We just, 
you know, with, yeah, whatever you want to do that, that's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, people can get the wrong message if we're not careful. That, that Being merciful doesn't mean that. And, and you cannot apply this beatitude to such thinking, but that's how some people are doing it today. Merciful, understand this, the word here, merciful. And I think it helps us to realize what it is. Merciful is an adjective that is especially applied to God. Not just to us, but not, not to men, not to people, but to God. God is merciful. Amen? God is righteous. And God is holy. And God is just. And God is against sin. Amen? So to be merciful cannot mean uh, that you just let anything go. Because to be merciful, merciful is, is something that describes God, and especially applied to God. And how many of us have learned, we, surely we have already learned, God does not just let everything go. Amen? Uh, God says you reap what you sow. Uh, and, 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 and so it does not mean easy going. Number two, what merciful is, it is having pity that leads to action. Having pity that leads to action. And there's a wonderful example in the New Testament. And the New Testament example is the parable of the, and you may have already guessed it, the Good Samaritan. Amen. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And beginning with uh, verse number 30. Luke chapter 10 verse 30. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And, and, and they notice, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he had departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, take care of him and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. And then he asked the question, Jesus, in giving this parable, uh, to those that he was speaking to. He says, Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto the man that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Now watch this. Mercy. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Amen. You know, this uh, uh, one he was uh, talking to, uh, it was a certain, certain lawyer, uh, the Bible describes, back up in verse number uh, 25. And, um, and, and the lawyer asked him when Jesus told him, uh, spoke to him, the lawyer said, well, well, who's my neighbor? And he gives the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan. Here was a priest of Israel walked by, passed by on the other side. It was a Levite of Israel passed by on the other side. I would suspect that Jesus knew the heart of this lawyer and he would have been right with that crowd. He would have passed by on the other side. And to, but, to, but to be merciful, uh, to be merciful is to have pity. It, it says in the, in the parable that the, that the Samaritan came along and he looked on this man in his distress. And what did the Bible say? It said that he had compassion on him. It is to, it is to have pity. It is to have compassion but that's not all that that man did, did was it? He, he, he not only had compassion on him, but he stopped and he helped him. And he provided for him. And so that's what being merciful is. It is having pity that leads to action. And Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. And then number three, what does it mean to be merciful? The ultimate example is Jesus. Can you say amen to that? The ultimate example of what it means to be merciful is Jesus himself. God looked upon man in his sinful state. 
It's like a man with his sin. It's like the man on the road that <laughs> fell into the to the thieves, to the robbers, and they beat him and, and stole from him and left him in the ditch for dead. God looked upon man in a sinful state and God had pity. And in his mercy, he sent his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gave him uh, to, uh, uh, to the cross as a sacrifice for man's sin. God looked upon sinful man with pity and he did something about it, amen. He did the only thing that could be done because sinful man could not save himself. Sinful man could not correct himself. Sinful man could not do anything that would make himself worthy of, of God's attention and of God's salvation. There was a price that had to be paid because the Bible, all the way back in the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel, the Bible always says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. There is a price that has to be paid for man's sin. And God the Father knew that as He looks with pity upon sinful man. And then in mercy, in essence, in sending Jesus Christ to the earth, my friend, you know what God has done? God has said, I will take care of it. I will provide for the need. Just like the Samaritan that looked at the man in the road and says, I need to take care of this. God has looked at your soul, my friend. He's looked at your spirit. He's looked at your life. He's looked at uh, sinful man in this world. And, and God the Father understood something had to be done. I am the only one that can do it, and I'll do it. And he sent Jesus Christ to take my place and your place upon that cross. And when Jesus was on the cross, like father, like son, Jesus willingly took upon Himself human flesh, came to seek and to save the lost, and on the cross He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Like Father, like Son. Jesus, the Savior. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the one who is nailed to the cross. Jesus, the one, the Bible says in the Gospels, that He came doing nothing but good. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He brought the good news of the salvation of the kingdom of God. He, he came to show us the Father. Jesus who did nothing but good. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was spit upon. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was rejected. And even in, after, and that was before he was nailed to the cross. And then when he was nailed to the cross, what did he do? He said, Father, I'm praying that you'll forgive them. They, they don't understand what's going on. They, uh, they, they, they just don't know what they're doing. You see, the thing about it is, I really believe that's the way it has been and that's the way it is with mankind all across the world throughout all of history. Man never knew what, 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 what they were doing until Jesus was hanging there before them on the cross. And really, in essence, it wasn't until after the resurrection that even his disciples understood what that cross was all about. You remember before he went to the cross, he told his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, and there they're going to, they're going to arrest me, and they're going to beat me, they're going to mock me, and they're going to crucify me. You remember even his disciples said, oh, no, no. They're not going to do that. They didn't even understand. But after the resurrection, they look back and you see, that's where we are. We're on the other side of the cross. We're on the other side of the resurrection. And God has been so faithful to give us a book, to give us the Bible, to give us the message of the gospel where we can look back and we can, we can see what happened on that cross by what He has given to us in His book. And you see, it's when you see Jesus on the cross. And I'm convinced it's only when you can, can with a spiritual eyes and spiritual mindset of faith in the Word of God that you see Jesus is on the cross. It's only, it's really, it's only then, my friend, that you really understand what in the world was going on that day. 
And, 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 and so the recipients, blessed are the merciful, just as God and as Jesus was merciful upon us. And then so the reward. We have the recipients, blessed are the merciful, then for the reward. And watch this. For they shall obtain mercy. They shall obtain mercy. Understand this. Obtaining mercy goes with giving mercy. And obtaining forgiveness goes with giving forgiveness. Matthew chapter number 18. You ought to look at it with me. Matthew chapter number 18 and verse uh, 21. I'm going to read quite a few verses. Verse 21 all the way down to the close of the chapter in verse number 35. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant, now watch it, the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. You see that? moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him uh, into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called them, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that, all, uh, that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, and watch this, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. You see, what does that mean? If I, if I can't do this, it means that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that I can't be saved. The real teaching of the Beatitudes and even of this, uh, of this text here in Matthew chapter 18 is not that we've got to do such things to be saved. It's that if we are saved, these are the things we're going to do. This man did, was, was given forgiveness, but he would not forgive. This man was showed mercy, but he would not be merciful. This man in Matthew 18 was an unsaved man, a lost man. And so the same application is made to us. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, the Bible says, And be ye kind one to another, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You see, what we're seeing here is the, the Bible is teaching we must be merciful because being merciful is being like Jesus. It's being like Him. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to, be him, uh, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And so what we're finding in the Beatitudes is these are things that, that, that not just that, that we should be doing, but these are things that if we're really saved, we will be doing. They're evidence 
of a real salvation, you see. Because, you see, the Bible teaches us that it's been God's plan all along. God ordained it. That we, that we, the followers of Christ, would become like Jesus. We'd become more and more like Him. If we will really understand these Beatitudes and reflect upon them and pray for God's help when we run across one that, that we struggle with, we need to see these attitudes in our lives because they really would be a reflection of Jesus in our life. Amen? And so we do have to ask the question uh, to examine ourselves. Be sure. Are, are, are these the things that are describing your life? If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, they, 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 they should be. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together, our heads bowed, our eyes closed for prayer church, and as we do, let me just make mention to someone that may have catching this uh, message online. Dear friend, these are not things you do in order to be saved. These are things that should be evident in, in, your, in your heart, in your spirit, in your life, if you are saved. And so they, must, they, they describe the life of a real Christian. And so we'd ask you today, are you a real Christian? Do the, does the Beatitudes describe your life? Are, are, are you merciful? Do you hunger and thirst for, for righteousness? Do you desire to walk closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and closer to God than uh, in, in every step of your life? Do, do, do you, are these things that, that you can see in your life? Dear friend, if you have no concern for it, you kind of shrug your shoulders to it or whatever, then, then, then I would have to honestly say, I would doubt very seriously that you even know what it means to be a Christian. I would doubt very seriously that you've ever been born again because these are the evidences. And our prayer at Grace Baptist Church is that, that, that they are evident in your life. And if not, that you would recognize your need and, and come to Christ and be saved before it's too late. You have opportunity now. Today's the day of salvation. You can call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And he'll not turn you away. He'll not deny you. And, and you can, uh, by that being born again, the Spirit of God come into your life. And, and you can see some changes take place. And among those changes would be these Beatitudes becoming evident in the attitudes, all the attitudes and disposition of your life. So Lord, we pray that uh, we, we do pray for you. We pray for you, friend, that this would be true, that you would trust Christ as your Savior. And, and, and we'll thank God uh, with you for it. Amen, church. Let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the Beatitudes. We thank you how that it's not just a haphazard thing. You pick one here and you pick one there. No, but the Lord Jesus gives us a very good uh, sequence of teaching. Each one builds upon the other. And we've come to this one now, Lord, that, that, that bears the truth that, 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 that we must ask ourselves the question, are we really saved? And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to hearts, that you would help us, that you'd help people. And people would realize where they stand and realize what they need. And, Lord, that they would see the need to trust Christ as Savior, Lord of their lives. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be more like you. Help us who do know you, who have been born again. Help us to have these, these attitudes and this disposition. Help us to be merciful and to be forgiving. Help us in all of these things. Not just to say that that's what we believe, but to truly live it out that other people could be blessed, that other people could benefit from, our, from, from the change that's taking place in our lives. And so, Lord, we'll thank you for what you've done, what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, let's sing a song together now. Brother Tim, come back and lead us once again. Page 306.